When I say the word werewolf, I think for most of us the words like full moon and being bitten comes to mind. And I bet that what you see in your mind thinking about that word is a hairy beast, half man, half wolf. This is an image that Hollywood perhaps not have created, but that has been used so often in movies and TV series that we easily get fooled and think that this is how things always have been. Not always and not everywhere though. The idea about people being turned into animals either by free will or by a curse is present more or less everywhere in the world. We have were llamas and river dolphins in South America, were coyotes in North America, were lions and panthers in Africa, were tigers and were snakes in Asia, and Europe comes with wolves and bears. Even the Inuits up in North Canada and Greenland has their own versions of this, where you can actually be turned into a polar bear. The different kinds of were animals are of course not called exactly that. I am using the term were animal here very loose. But the reasons are pretty much the same. The ability to be changed into an animal either by a curse or by free will, because you know magic, seems to be pretty much the same, regardless of where you are in the world. It's either a punishment or a way to cause damage on others and others' property. The Swedish word for werewolf is varulv, and it stems from the Old Norse word var that means man and ulv that means wolf. As usual, in the older Scandinavian folklore, you meet all kinds of names for this being, depending a bit on where you are. In Sweden, the name was Marulv, Mannulv, Mankuse, Vittvarg or Vargkärring, if it was a woman. In the Swedish-speaking areas of Finland, there is also the word Folkvarg, which translates into people wolf. Wait, wait, you say. What about the word Lycanthropia, then? Well, that is actually from the Greek myth about King Lycaon. He was turned into a wolf because he was offering his own son to the god Zeus instead of the animal he was supposed to offer. This angered Zeus and thus the king got turned into a wolf. So you can see that the myth about the werewolf are very old and even if we don't know when the stories about people turning into wolves started up here in Scandinavia, we do know that they are mentioned in the Icelandic sagas. There are stories told in the Icelandic sagas about a man called Ulf, and he was a fierce warrior but had a very bad temper. It isn't said outright in the story that he is a werewolf, but it's heavily implied, not only by his name that actually means wolf, but most people that read this story agrees around that, yeah, he is a werewolf. After the Viking Age and into the medieval times, the stories about people that turn into wolves continues. And mostly it is considered to be a punishment to be turned into a wolf, at least in Sweden and Norway. Here we will find that huge and sadly very common racism that has been present in Swedish speaking areas for a very long time. I mentioned this in my video about trolls and also in my lecture about folklore I held during Atlantis University. But I feel this is yet another time where I have to address this. Because here in the stories about werewolf, it is even more clear and present. In the north of Norway, Finland and Sweden, the indigenous people called Sami has lived for thousands of years, herding their reindeers, cultivating their own culture and religion. We know that trading happened between Vikings and Sami, and when two groups of people meet, of course there will be some kind of cultural exchange. So, of course, Sami influenced the Vikings, and the Vikings influenced the Sami. But somewhere during history, we stopped being friends, and the people in the south did exactly what the US had done to the Native Americans. We tried to erase their culture. The Sami people was deemed uncultivated, unchristian, and even dangerous. We forbid them to use their language in school, and we in all kinds of ways behaved like shits towards them. Racism is never a pretty thing. An old racist slur for Sami was Lap, and if you read Scandinavian folklore, you will see this word very often in the context of an evil shaman that puts a hex on a woman or a man. If it wasn't a Sami, then it probably was a Finn. Creating bad people out of the one that lives close to you but has a different culture seems to be no, more or less universal. And we Swedes haven't always been that nice people towards our neighbours. Nope.
This type of racism is something that you can see in the old folklore. And like I said, when it comes to the stories about werewolf, it is even more present. Because the two ways you can get a curse of being a wolf is a hex from a shaman or a witch, or if your mother was scared for birth pain and turned to magic for help. In the first version, with a shaman, well, like I said, it's always a Sami or a Finn. The other one, where your mother was scared for birth pains and turned to magic for help, she did this by crawling through a horse's call. You know that icky, slimy part that is around the fetus? And you was believed to share the ease that a horse seems to have when it gives birth. And thus you didn't have to deal with the pain. This is very common in folklore magic, this kind of thinking. Same for same. A horse seems to have an ease to give birth and thus you share that ease by doing something that comes from a horse giving birth. This was of course a sin and a crime against nature, the one was supposed to suffer, blah blah blah, yeah. Hear my deep sigh over patriarchy. So if she did this, her child was cursed. If it was a girl, she turned into a Mara, a being I will go into in another video. But if it was a boy, he turned into a werewolf. An example of the stories about being hexed is the story from Narke. It's about a wedding that happened and a group of Sami entered the festivities. And they are not welcomed, so they are told to leave. This doesn't sit well with one of the Sami, and he put a curse on the whole wedding party and everyone was turned into a wolf and had to run out to the woods. The story doesn't end there. These wolves were said to wreak havoc in the area for a very long time. And then one was shot, and that's when they discovered that this was a full-dressed man under the wolf hide. There are many versions of this story, both in Sweden, Finland and Estonia. And in some versions, the wolf that is shot is the bride herself. And in some stories, the bride actually gets to become human again, because someone recognizes something on the fur and understands that this is her, and thus call her by name. So, what do we learn from this story? Well, first off, the hospitality in Scandinavia is very important and has been so since at least the old Viking days. You do not turn away a guest, especially not during such a thing as a wedding, even if he isn't invited in the first place. If people come begging for food and shelter, you are kind of obliged to give them that. And this goes even if you are a puffed up racist bastard. But the versions of this story when the bride isn't shot, but instead turned back into a human, also tells us something. And that is how to break the curse. Saying a werewolf's name was the most common way to break the curse up here in Scandinavia. There are numerous stories about how to release a person of this curse by saying their name. There is one about a farmer's wife that is very widespread and has many different versions. In short, it goes like this. The husband was a werewolf because his mother had made the forbidden magic and crawled through a horse's call. The wife, of course, didn't know this when they marry, but uh, when she was pregnant and they were working on a field one day, he felt the wolf came over him. The wife didn't want him to leave because being pregnant, she feared the wolf. Wolves, and especially werewolves, was thought to have been extra keen on attacking pregnant women. He left her anyway, but told her to climb up in the wagon so she could feel safer in case a wolf came running. And he also told her that in that case, scream his name. Just a moment after he left, indeed, a wolf came running out of the woods and tried to attack the wife. She managed to save herself up on the wagon, so the wolf only got a bit of her skirt in his mouth. And she called out, Oh my god, I think you are greedier than my pad. And suddenly there was her husband standing with a bit of a skirt between his teeth. He thanked her, because now the curse was broken and he didn't have to run like a wolf anymore. So what you might have noticed now is that the traditional Hollywood rules about turning into a beast during a full moon and becoming a werewolf by being bitten isn't something that is present in the old folklore from Scandinavia. But sometimes people turn into wolves by their own will to get revenge or just an easy way to get to your neighbors, horses or cows. The idea that you can turn yourself into an animal by putting on a wolf or bear skin is very old. There are tales in the Icelandic sagas that hints about this. Likewise, there are picture stones way older than the sagas that show people that seem to be wearing animal hides with the head of a wolf or a bear. 
carrying weapons so they are clearly warriors. Later on in history, the most common way to transform yourself is to make a special belt. Sometimes it is just made out of the skin of a wolf or bear, but in many tales it needed to be done by human skin, sometime by as many as seven skins from the back of hanged criminals. The idea that hanged criminals contained some magic is very common in a lot of folklore around the world, so much that during some parts of history they had to guard the gallows so people didn't sneak in to get a finger or a piece of hair etc. from a hanged man. Icky, but most folklore is. This thing about a belt that can turn you into a wolf is very common also further in south of Europe. And it's hard to say where this idea actually comes from in the beginning, but belts that gives men extra strength and magic is just as old as the idea of putting on a hide. Yet again we see folklore stories travel and change and taking influence of each other. Not many stories like this are about wolves up in Scandinavia though. Turning yourself into an animal up here was more often about becoming a bear. And those stories there are plenty of. There is this story about Chapa Lisbeth, an old woman that is said to live up in Arnas in Ångermanland, and she was believed to know magic. The story was written down 1944 and was told by the old man Olof Kjellström, and he tells it like this. Erik Ersa, han talade om Käpa Lisbet, att hon gjorde sig till björn och rev hästar. Han talade om att hon kom från Hammerdal en gång och där hade de mist en fjolårsmär. Och då hon kom hit så hade hon slickat sig om mun och var så mätt. Hon ville inte ha någonting. There is also a story about a farmer that get helps from a Sami man during some work out on a bog. They had packed up some food because they needed to be away for some days and then they started walking. But when they are walking past the farmer's horses, the farmer noticed something strange. The Sami man is making smacking noises and uh, the farmer gets suspicious. So when the evening falls and they go to bed, he only pretends to sleep. And very right he was, because as soon as he is pretending to be sleeping, the man goes up and take out a strange looking belt. He starts to crawl through it, and the first time he gets a bear's head, the second time he gets the fur, and a third time he is turned completely into a bear. He then goes out the door and disappears for the night. When he comes back, he does the same thing with the belt, but this time he starts with his feet and not the head. And after crawling through it the third time, he is back in his human shape again. In the morning he lay there sleeping, satisfied and full. The farmer didn't want to have anything to do with this man now, so he left and went home the very same morning. And when he got home, he saw that his best horse was dead and eaten. To kill or stop a shaman or a witch to do this, you needed to kill the animal with a bullet that was made out of a wedding band. This is probably where the idea of a silver bullet comes from. And in the story I just told about the farmer that lost his horse, it is actually said a silver bullet. And the skin the belt is made from was from a man that was murdered. But you could also wrap the bullet in a torn page from the Bible or dip the bullet in holy water. Christianity offers many ways to defeat these were animals. And another way to stop them was to destroy the belt. And that of course was dangerous too because then you left a very angry shaman alive to get revenge on you. What said he didn't put sickness on you and your livestock? Now, how could you know that this was a werebear or a werewolf that you met? When it came to the bear, it was usually discovered like in the story of about the farmer or Chapa Lisbeth. Or some hunters followed a track and the track from the bear ended up at a cottage or a cot. When it came to the wolves, they were sometimes said to run on three legs because they used their hind leg as a tail. One thing was clear though, there was always something strange with these animals, something that made you suspicious. They didn't behave like other animals and they wasn't afraid of the fire. There are numerous stories about bears and wolves that have been shot and under their hide the hunters found a tinderbox for fire or a knife or buttons something that showed that this was once a human. 
So next time you're out in the Scandinavian wilderness and you meet a wolf that seems to behave strangely or is running on three legs, start shouting out all the names you know in Swedish and hope that you get one of them right. Or just start running and don't stop running until you know you are safe home. Because it might be a werewolf. Ooh.